Another important type of plot that we use quite often when visualizing data is scatter plots. And once again, this is something you have seen before. So here we are saying plot mpg as a function of horsepower. Right? Of course, we used this kind of expression earlier for box plots. But in box plots, what came on the right hand side was a factor. So for every value of the factor, we got a different box. In this case, both of these values, uh, both of these columns are numeric. And when you use plot on two numeric variables, you get a scatter plot. And it looks like this. Right? So horsepower is on the x-axis. Remember, this says y as a function of x. So what is on the right hand side is the x-axis, left hand side is the y-axis and therefore you get mpg on the y-axis and horsepower on the x-axis. And for every value in the data set, it is showing you a point. Okay, And of course you can see here that some of the points are more densely uh, populated here and therefore they are overlapping, whereas in other cases there is not much of an overlap. Okay, So that's what is a a scatter plot and clearly a scatter plot is very useful in terms of getting an idea of the overall trend uh, of how one variable affects other variables. So from this it's pretty clear that as horsepower increases the miles per gallon is so sort of tending to go down and this trend is not linear because you can see that if it were linear then these points would look sort of like distributed along a straight line but here you see that there is a clear quadratic curve Okay, that is the drop is not as severe uh, at the higher ranges of horsepower than at the lower ranges. So that's what you're seeing. Here. Okay, but of course this is not an exact function because the points are. If you drew a line, then all the points will not fall on the line. Some will fall on, but many, most, in fact, would fall off the line. So this is not a clear, uh, well-defined function, but it gives us an idea of a trend that you see in the data. Often. When you have a scatter plot, you also want to plot the regression line along with the scatter plot. It's very easy to add on to a scatter plot, uh, and you can do it like this. So I'm saying plot mpg, the function of horsepower, and then I'm saying uh, plot a linear model, right? So from the earlier course, you know that lm is a function that you use for linear regression in R. So I'm saying generate the linear regression between mile uh, or for mileage as a function of horsepower and store the result in a variable called mod. I used equal to here. I could have used the, uh, the more formal assignment operator, less than dash, could have done that. Uh, nevertheless, the linear model is now available in this variable called mod. And I can once again use the function that adds a line on top of an existing plot. Right. So this would have created the scatter plot. I'm saying keep the scatter plot. And then on top of that, add a line which represents this regression equation. Okay, and the function there that is called the abline function. So if you did that, you will get the scatter plot, but you will also get the regression line. Okay, so the linear regression line looks like this, but clearly the trend is not linear in this case, it's very clearly quadratic. Okay, so that's what you're seeing here to do a scatter do a scatter plot along with a regression line. Now many times when your data set has many variables, again following the advice of Tufti, try to show many variables. So instead of just doing a scatter plot of two variables, we can try and do a scatter plot of many variables. So in this case, I want to do a scatter plot that shows mpg, displacement, horsepower and weight. Four variables. right? And the way you specify that uh, in R is first of all to use the function pairs that creates a scatter plot matrix and to specify the variables that you want to plot in the scatter plot matrix you just put a tilde and then uh, mention all the variables connected with plus signs and then you say of course data equals auto because auto is the name of our data set okay so if you do that you will get a scatter plot matrix which is actually showing many scatter plots at the same time so once again this is showing uh, following two of Tufti's principles. One is show many variables. Second is show comparisons. Okay, so here is our uh, scatter plot of displacement of uh, over MPG. Now, first of all, how do you interpret each scatter plot? Meaning, for every scatter plot, which variable is on the x axis, which variable is on the y axis? To do that, let's take this particular scatter plot as an example. For this scatter plot, and here are the variable names. 
for this scatter plot which variable name appears on the y axis displacement right because displacement is what is on the y axis side of this plot and mpg is on the x axis side of the plot although it's on top okay and in fact this is to the right it doesn't matter so this is a plot of mpg on the x axis and displacement on the y axis on the other hand this plot is a plot of displacement on the x-axis and mpg on the y-axis and this is in fact the plot we saw earlier okay so you can see this this trend of course these two plots are really the same thing with the axis sw switched around okay now one interesting thing you see here is that there is a very linear trend between uh, th for this particular plot weight is on the x-axis because weight the, the label weight is on the x-axis and displacement is on the y-axis so this plot is basically a plot of weight on the x-axis displacement on the y-axis and the trend is very linear as opposed to let's say this plot or this plot where the trend is kind of quadratic okay and in fact both of these plots show a linear trend but this probably shows a tighter linear trend than than even this Okay, and in fact, this is also pretty linear. Displacement with with weight, it's pretty linear. Right? Of course, all of this is to be expected. An engine with a bigger displacement is a bigger, uh, will will have a bigger volume, and therefore it's likely to be heavier as well, and so on. Right. So again, we are able to see many variables, and we are able to make comparisons. And uh, the the thing about exploratory data analysis is that you're given a data set. And you really don't know what is in the data set. Quite often, uh, you have only a vague idea of what is there, right? So you need some things that will prod you to ask more and more questions, okay? And visualization is what helps us to do that. So, for example, now we've uh, made several observations. We've said, oh, this looks like a quadratic, uh, you know, uh, like a quadratic uh, relationship. In other words, the initially the drop is pretty large. And gradually the drop uh, thins out as you go further. We might ask a question: Why is that so? Why is that happening? Why is the drop not uh, somewhat linear? The other other things, several of them seem linear. We can ask a question: Why is that the case? Okay, uh, and also we can see here that there are some, you know, uh, some data points that seem to kind of hang out, uh, you know, out of the real regular pattern. Right? So those seem to be kind of special things. So we can ask a question, what are they? What's going on with those things? Right? So the moment you are able to generate these kinds of questions, then you have something to do within the data. You start go uh, exploring the data, find answers to these questions, and then you generate more questions and find answers to those questions, and then you suddenly start understanding the data set better. Okay? That's really the idea. Okay. Now many times, you want to plot multiple charts on the same thing, right? Which again sort of uh, uh, goes with the Tufty's guidelines of first of all showing comparisons and secondly showing many variables, okay? So just showing an example of how to plot multiple plots. To plot multiple plots, forget the first line now, we'll come back to it. I'm saying I want to plot two plots on one row, right? That's what I'm saying here. C, one comma two. I want one row, two columns, and I, I first before I plot, I want to say that. In other words, what we are saying here is we are saying divide the plot. Normally, the plotting area is used to plot one chart. Here we are saying divide the plotting area so that I am able to plot two charts on it, and I want those two charts to be organized as one row and two columns. Okay. And the way you specify that is by using the par function. Par, par basically controls all the graphics parameters. Okay, so par mf row equals c12. In other words, divide the plotting area into uh, you know one row and two columns so that I can plot two charts now in this. Then uh, we'll we'll discuss what is mf row. What does that mean? We'll discuss that. And then. Uh, I'm just saying with auto, in other words, with auto as the data set, plot MPG with weight and, you know, call the, give the chart this name and then plot MPG with acceleration 
and give the chart that name, right? Because remember, we can plot two charts here. So this will be the first chart. This will be the second chart. And uh, of course, this is the first chart. It will appear on the left. This is the second chart. It will appear on the right. Okay. So that's what uh, we are doing here. Now, why is it that we are saying old dot par is par? Because see, what we are doing here is we are changing some plotting parameters and those would be changed forever. Okay. Now, we don't want to do that because uh, we want to change the parameters, look at our charts and then set it back to what it was. You know, leave the leave the house clean, kind of. You know, you move in, do all your stuff and before you go, you clean out the house and leave it the way it was. Right? So that's what we are doing here. And to do that, you just say par is old, uh, old, old dot par is par. So par function by itself returns all the graphics parameters. Okay? So before we make the change, we get all the graphics parameters, save them in a variable called old dot par, then do whatever stuff we need to do. You know, change, we may not change just one parameter. We may change 10 graphing parameters. Okay, make all the changes, do all your plotting. And once you're done with everything, set the house right by saying par old dot par, right? So in old dot par, we have saved all the old parameters. We are saying, okay, restore everything back to what it was. Okay. So that's what these two lines are doing, okay? And MF row, see sometimes you may divide your plotting area not into one row, but into multiple rows and columns. So I may say, give me three rows and two columns, right? In which case, you can it can plot six different graphs for you, right? And then you will plot each graph one by one. Then the order in which the graphs get into the boxes matters, okay? MF row says the charts will be filled in to the slots on a row wise basis, right? So it will fill the first row, then the second row, then the third row and so on. That is what MF row would do, right? Or you, you could do MF call, in which case the filling order will be by column. It will finish the first column, then go to the second column and then go to the third column. Of course, with only one row and two columns, MF row and MF call will actually have the same effect. Right, because it's going to fill the first, suppose we said MF call here, it will fill the first column. Of course, there's only one item in the first column, it will fill that and then it will fill the second. So for this particular example, MF row or MF call would work fine. But if you actually had many rows and columns, then this would determine the order in which the slots get taken. Okay, so this is the way in which you would generate multiple plots. If you did that, then you would see these plots. Okay, this is the first plot, that's the second plot. Okay, so that's how you do multiple plots. Okay, so that com completes our discussion of base graphics. We'll now go on to discuss uh, an advanced graphing uh, library that R has called ggplot. We'll take a look at that soon.